Thank you so much for watching Rift TV. Now this interview is obviously with video, but I don't interview everybody on Zoom. That's why I put it on my Talkin' Rock with Meltdown podcast. We talk to rock artists from all over the genre. So check out Talkin' Rock with Meltdown wherever you get your podcasts. And now to today's video interview. And there he is in all his Los Angeles glory. Ricky, how are you? <laughs> I'm wearing the beanie hat to remind me of home, but I'm in Nottingham, in Nottingham in England. I'm very well, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks yeah, for good. having me on. Yeah, for sure. So I was going to ask you, when was the last time you were here uh, stateside? Well, I live in Los Angeles. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I have done for 18 years. All right. I thought so, that, uh, I don't know why, for whatever reason, I thought you lived over in Europe, but I think maybe last time you did tell yeah. me about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so two weeks ago. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. To answer the question. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, know, it's, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about this earlier today when, uh, when I was, uh, uh, you know, getting ready to talk to you. You're the one that yeah. told me about the guitars on the big country albums. Yeah. Right. I, I didn't realize those were guitars. So, as soon as we talked that day, I remember going home and I'm like, I got to listen to these things over again. That's right. Because you thought they were synths, right? I saw it. I didn't know what they were, but I didn't think they were guitars. Yeah. Before. But yeah, man, what, no. what great records those are. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I I blatantly stole a big country riff on the new record. Um, I, you know, I know those guys well enough to, to get away with it. And uh, yeah, they're a big influence on me. I love that band. Yeah, the, uh, great stuff right there. So uh, The Wrong Side of uh, Paradise is uh, out. It's been out for a couple weeks. And uh, I guess uh, you're the last man standing as far as the Black Star Riders are concerned or the last Black Star Rider standing, right? Is that how it works? Yeah, it's really me and, and Robbie Crane. Robbie's been with us since the second record. Um, you know, Robbie's my, my bro. Uh, and uh, But yeah, you know, listen, you know, 10 years the band's been going. It's not a jail sentence being in a band. It's free. Right. You're free to you're free to come and go, and things happen, and the pandemics happen, and people timelines get changed, and things get things get moved around. But I think as long as we're making great music, which I feel that we are, then then that's okay. That makes everything legit, you know. Now, uh, Scott, of course, uh, he left to go back, and he, he what is he? Is he like semi-retired now? Is that the deal? Yeah, he's kind of yeah, kind of. You know, as retired as you'll you'll ever get when somebody that's a lifer in rock and roll. But he 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 doesn't want to do the six seven weeks in the tour bus anymore. And I I get that. I totally yeah. get that. I was going to say you can't blame him for that. He's done it his whole life. Well, exactly. You know, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still like doing that? Um, you know, I do. Yeah, I do. And especially when we had it taken away from us for for, for two years, that that really brought it home. I do. I enjoy it more now. Um, you know, sobriety helps a lot. And just being, going to cities now and exploring them and, and seeing places and soaking it in a lot more. It kind of means more to me now, if that makes sense, you know? It means, that, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So um, I didn't realize you were sober. So because I have friends, a lot of bands, I was just talking about this with somebody just mm. the other day, how that you can't believe how many rock bands are sober. Like back when we were kids and stuff, none of them were sober. And now yeah. are, a lot of them are. But well, look, I, I spent 40 years drinking and having a good time. I started, I drank when I was 15 years old and it was never, I would never consider myself, you know, fortunately an alcoholic but I like to drink and I just got to the point where and somebody said to me, don't you wish you'd stop 10 years ago? And I went, no, because I had a great time and it was right for me at that time. But about it just over a year ago, I was just like, I'm done. I'm done. I've, I've been down that road. I've always kind of looked after myself, but I would, you know, I would train hard and I would eat bad or drink, you know, pack a pack of beer at a weekend, a couple of whiskeys. I thought this isn't, you know, let's, let's try it without this. And best decision I ever made. So one of my friends, uh, uh, Brad from Three Doors Down, and he's told me this publicly, sure. so I'm not speaking out of school, but uh, he said that uh, you know he was just he would drink because of the boredom on tour, and you just mentioned that's how, it, yeah, he just that's just it, mentioned. yeah. You know, I'm, I've been out here uh, for the last two weeks, and what I've been doing is a record store in store tour where I've been going around all the record labels and record stores in the UK, excuse me, yeah. playing acoustically in the stores and signing to meet meeting the the fans, the Blackstar writers fans in the stores. And it's been incredible. But there's been some downtime. And, you know, before that would have been going to the pub. And now you don't, you know, you have, you have that. So now you, you're, you're filling with more constructive stuff and uh, it's just all around better. But yeah, I totally agree with him. It was, the boredom was, was a big factor before. You go, ah, let's just go to the pub. 
You know, that was the excuse. You know, yeah. I had another one of my friends, and this doesn't sound like you're in the situation that he was in, but he told me that he would have to wake up every day and apologize for what he did the night before. <laughs> that's happened a few times. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, that's happened a few times. Uh, I've had to do that. Not, not thankfully not frequently but there's definitely been a few instances where i've kind of gone up and went am i still in the band the next day so how how many so you said one year so are you just one, a year just okay so yep. so when uh how has that helped you uh with your songwriting your performing all that kind of stuff it's just helped me with with clarity with with um my overall well-being just mentally and, and physically um I would I would always had a beer and maybe a, a couple of shots of whiskey before going on stage and obviously I don't do that anymore and I'm finding I'm enjoying the gigs more hmm. and I just it's just all right I mean everybody's different for me that's what works right now I want to continue doing this for as long as I can and to, to, I, I felt to be able to do that that I had to start really looking after myself and and the alcohol was was, was something that it had to be knocked on the head yeah my my wife just said to me. I might be speaking a little bit out of school in my life, but my wife's like, you haven't snored the last two days. <laughs> I went to bed sober the last two days. <laughs> well, that's it. Hey, listen, being Irish as well, there's obviously, you know, and the whole drinking culture that comes with that. So there's obviously that, you know, going back home to Ireland for the first time, there was, uh, you know, what, you know, what do you mean? What do you mean? You're not drinking, you know, but everybody's been super cool about it, you know? And, and, uh, like I said, um, I've been able to go out. You know, I went out New Year's Eve and I drove and I had a great time and I stayed out till four in the morning and, you know, didn't drink one drop of alcohol and I just had a great night. So it's just working right now. I mean, I don't really want to harp on about it too much because I'm like, oh, he's one of these preachers that's yeah, not drinking. Right. You know, it's just, it, for me, that's what works right now. Right, it works for you, you know? exactly. Yeah. I remember when I when I quit smoking 23 years ago and that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. I kind of avoid right. places that would kind of trigger that. So it's Sure, like, sure. I, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. But uh, no, that's that's good. Good for you, man. So um, you. also, I want to ask about uh, Christian Martucci. So so he leaves, yeah. he leaves the band, obviously, <laughs> to go with uh, Corey and Stone Sour. So yeah. he had a little bit of a turnover here in the last couple of years. Yeah. You know, the pandemic messed the timeline up. I mean, the way we would work it, we would obviously be quite meticulous in our planning that we would put a Black Star Riders record. Out. We'd be able to tour it for a year, 18 months. Christian would go off, do his Corey stuff for 18 months, whatever. I would have done my solo stuff. That was fine until you, you get a worldwide pandemic and then suddenly everybody wants the pandemic's clear, wants to, and rightly so, wants to put records like Corey being no exception. And Corey is in the studio right now uh, working on a new record with Christian. Christian's his boy. He's been with him 15 years, um, you know, uh, way longer than he's ever been a Black Star writer. So unfortunately, that was just something that they had to give. And, 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 and Christian, you know, just said, like, guys, I got to go do this. Corey's my guy. We, we, we get it. You know, we understand. And, and, and you got to go and do that absolutely and we'll we'll figure it out and we did we got a guy in called sam wood mm -hmm. who's a phenomenal guitar player um uh, based here in the uk and and sam's just he looks like a young scott gorham mm -hmm. he plays like scott gorham scott gorham's <laughs> his hero and he's just a, he's a, a good human being and we're delighted to have him you know in the band so you know out of something crazy something always good tends to happen as well you know yeah, and then of course, like you said, you got uh, Robbie as well. Did, does he bring up uh, rat stories uh, on on the road? Oh, dude, Robbie can Robbie can talk for America. So um, you know, I, I Robbie's I call Robbie my morale technician because he's just so funny and so up, and I just love love the energy the guy brings on the road. He's a funny, funny man, and he tells great stories, does great impressions of everybody because he's telling the story, he'll impersonate the people he's <laughs> telling the story about, yeah. and he's got it done, man. And it's just awesome. And I just love the I love I love being around Robbie. I love writing with him. I love he's a phenomenal bass player. He's just a good, good, solid human being and he's just great to be in a band with. That is hysterical. It reminds me like of uh, Zach Wilde. Whenever Zach starts talking about Ozzy or something, he goes into Ozzy's voice. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes. I've seen Zach do that. Yes indeed, yeah. Yeah. But uh, it, it's, you know, I was thinking about this earlier that, you know, you've had guys leave the band, but all the guys leave the band, you guys are all like hugging and hey, man, I, I understand. I, I totally. Hey, yeah. No, but the key, key is just what you said. The guys left the band. Nobody was kicked out. Nobody right. was fired. Or like we, it was all like, hey, and, you know, that door's open. So if anybody wants to come back and get up and jam or play a few songs or whatever, we're like, yeah, come on, we're family, you know, and and, and we all get it in this day and age, as, as you probably well know, being in one band sometimes isn't quite enough. You know, so you have to diversify and do other things and, 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 and spin a few plates. And, you know, that's that's what we're all trying to do. And, and, and you know, 
usually it, it works out okay but obviously with the pandemic i hate to go on about it but yeah it did mess things up but you know we'll, we'll make it work and I, I i like to say as long as the music's relevant and the music's still vital and still energetic and still meaningful that's that's the main thing what other kind of stuff are you doing like you said you guys spin other plates is there anything um else? i i um i write i write some stuff for some other people i i put a solo record out um last year and i did some touring in the uk off the back of that and um so I concentrate on that and a few other bits and pieces going on as well that I've been working on. So would you consider this, uh, um, the wrong side of paradise, your pandemic album? It seems like every, pandemic. no, 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 because it was written before the pandemic. Oh, I got you. So, okay. Yeah. It was pretty much done and dusted. There was only two songs I wrote. I wrote two songs on the record. The week we started record, we started, we recorded it in October of last year. So 2021. So we were just coming out of the pandemic and I wrote two songs just prior to going into the studio but the majority of it was written very early 2020 before we went into the first lockdown. Mm. Yeah. So it would have been around this time then three years ago. Yeah. Three years ago. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me about the uh, picture on the album. Well, <laughs> we wanted to have a band picture on the album, <laughs> <laughs> but we couldn't work out who was in the band that week. When we took the band. So, um, we wanted to do a band photograph uh, because we've never had one. All three Black Star writers, we've always had artwork. So we thought we'll do a band photograph. And we did an amazing photo session with uh, the great Ross Halfin. The mm -hmm. people know his work. Yeah. Turned out amazing. Ross is great. His work speaks for itself. And we boom, we had our cover. Then Christian had to do, go and do the Corey thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, what are we going to do? You know, we don't have a cover. So I, I went to a guy called Paul Tippett, who we've pretty much worked with on every Black Star Writers album. And I said, Paul, you know, we need to come up with something. Uh, you know, he's like, what do you got? What's the album title? So I'll start sending him over some lyrics and send him over Wrong Side of Paradise. And he sort of picked my brain about what the song was about and, and depicting. And he really came back with that cover. You know, I grew up in Northern Ireland in, in the 70s and 80s at the height of the, the troubles over there. Uh, sadly, barricades and walls were a part of everyday life for me when I was a kid. There, were, there was one at the end of my street and you know, to keep us segregated. And as a kid, it was a sense of wonderment because you don't know the sinister reasons behind it. You just think, well, there's a wall. What's on the other side of it? Is it like amazing over there? Are they having a better time than we are? Do yeah. they look different? You know, you're just all those questions you ask. And it was kind of taking that and developing that as I grew, grew older. And just sadly now, you know, as a species, we're still seeing me building walls and dividing people instead of building bridges and, and bringing people together. And, you know, trying to get a bit of empathy and understanding and love. We just seem to be putting up barricades and walls and fear and hatred, and you know. Yeah, that, that it reminded me a little bit when I went to, I think it was Belize or Cozumel or something, and we were like in the two yeah. area, and you could see through the gates, guys walking around with AK-47s on the other side. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's kind of like what it is. Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit nod to that and a nod to the fact that, you know, again, you know, we 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 – have developed so much and we have so much technology and and so wealthy as a planet and 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 yet this you know people can't afford health care or education as people go in hungry as people work in three jobs just to keep a roof over their head you know and that's just not living and it shouldn't be that way it just shouldn't be that way it's wrong and um i think i'm just sort of you know tapping into that that aspect that aspect of it as well mm -hmm. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, in stores a little while ago. I saw some pictures on your Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. So, sure. uh, how have those been going? You know, it was amazing. Thank you. And um, we did twenty of those in thirteen days. Wow. Yeah, we were doing two a day. Um, uh, I say we. It was only me. It was playing, but I had my tour manager, Black Star right. tour manager, came out with me and looked after me. It was unbelievable because I'm a record. You know, I, I grew up in record stores. I love them. I'm a vinyl junkie. I, um, I love everything about them. So. For me, that was a no-brainer to go back and do that. And and it's great to see that people are buying records again. And there's more of these independent little record stores mm -hmm. beginning to spring up in, in the cities, especially over here in the UK. You know, I've, you know, seven, eight years ago, you might have been hard pushed to find 20, 25 stores to go and do that in. We could have done 30 or 40 of these shows. There's yeah. that many and again. Now. And that's just great, you know. And the turnout was fantastic. I played about eight songs acoustically. I played a few from the new album, a couple of oldies, and then and then I would just hang and talk and sign stuff and hang out and you know what a great day to what a great way to spend the day, right? You know, <laughs> you know what I, I this really came to the forefront during the pandemic that um you know 
we weren't we weren't allowed to see people and hang out with people and blah 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 and everything shut down like in march of 2020 sure and i've told this story before but in september late september metallica put out that live concert thing and that was like the first event I really went to. Do you know what I'm talking about? They right. did a yeah. concert. Yeah. And I yeah. realized at that moment that going to concerts and doing that kind of stuff, you're hanging out with people of your own ilk. And that's really what draws a lot of us together. And that's what was it missing. Does. And you couldn't be around. And now all of a sudden you're with people and you're able to talk yeah. music with them and they're there, they admire what you're doing. And you know, you get this it's back great. and forth. It's great. It's it's a real, you know, I mean, sort of unifying factor. Music obviously brings people together. And where would we have been? throughout the whole pandemic without the arts we'd have been screwed you know it, it, it's, it's 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 salvation and for me it's great to meet people you know there's some people that that come to the end stores that aren't comfortable going to shows because they have certain issues so they're like it's great that we could come to an in-store and get to see you up personal or they have a disability that might stop them going to the show so it was nice to meet meet some of those people and, and i think they appreciated the fact that you know that you know that was a chance to hear some of the songs and and, and get their Blackstar Rider stuff signed and and you know so it was just lovely and it was a lot we a real mixture of people you know everything from you know the older generation to people bringing their kids along and you know it was it was it was lovely it was really good yeah and I I wrote something on our our website not that long ago about how the uh, the 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 in store has almost become like a lost art. You remember when we yeah. were kids? When we were kids, oh uh, man, I remember going to see Black Sabbath in 1999. Yeah, when yeah. I mean, they, well, they I doing them, you know, I remember doing them back in the day with my old band, The Almighty, and we still have some great ones. You know, back when Tar Records was still going, I remember doing Tar Records in Piccadilly Circus in London, and we'd over two thousand people at it. Yeah, at an in store, you know, and we were there for seven, eight, seven hours, and it's just incredible. But I think it genuinely is coming back, and I'm seeing it even more. I have children of my own, my own sort of teenage daughter. It, has asked for a turntable and is asking for vinyl and because I think people are just realizing yeah it's great that you can just go click your finger and get a song instantly on your phone you can get it there and listen to it but the whole experience of seeing artwork and lyrics and all that kind of coolness that comes with an album um, I think people are kind of going okay this is unique we can't replace this and I think that's starting to to, to sink in to obviously our generation we know that but even even the younger kids and i start to appreciate that which is wonderful yeah i'm a vinyl junkie i've got about uh, me too yeah i got about six or seven hundred but you know you know who started it who i blame this whole thing on is johnny chow do you know johnny chow yeah 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 it was it was almost exactly six years ago to the day that i was interviewing him just like this and i've known chow mm -hmm. for years and right. uh, well, i was on the phone with him when he says uh he says, yeah, we only listen to music at my house on vinyl. And I went home that day and I told my wife, I said, order me a, a, a turntable. And that's what started you know, this that... disaster I'm in now. So, so yeah, I'm... you know, I mean, I, I, I'm like you, I dipped out of it as well. You know, I dipped out of it and, and when the CD thing took off and then obviously, obviously I, I, I went into the, the Apple thing when that started, you know, with, with the, with the iPods and all that kind of stuff. Isn't this great? And then I just was like, nah. I missed it. And, and it was only about seven, eight years ago that I really got back into it again. And now I'm, I'm actually replacing a lot of the albums that, you know, that I get lost in, in moves or fights fights with girlfriends over the years and they take half your record collection or, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm rebuilding it back up and I've got quite a, an amazing collection. You know, the funny thing about doing the in-stores was uh, it cost me a fortune. I was going to say, how many did you buy there, right? <laughs> oh, dude it, dude, it was insane because you're just, you know, you get it. Obviously, they're great and they give you a discount, but you still want to support the store, so you want to sure. pay for it. Um, but, yeah, I was like, this is costing me a fortune. I said to our record label, I said, you, you got to give me some per diems here because I'm spending <laughs> a fortune on records here. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, that's funny you mentioned it because as soon as you said you were doing in-stores, my first thought was, man, I can't walk into a record store and not walk out with three or four or five. Or I six. know, right? Yeah, yeah. The thing that was kind of holding me back was I'm going, we start our UK tour here uh, next next Saturday, and I knew that I, I was going to do that. I thought well, I don't want to lug all these records on the tour bus for the next three weeks. So that was kind of, that kind of put me off. I think if I just done it and been going home, I'd have been going home with a box of vinyl. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> and you mentioned your record label, so new record label as well, huh? Yeah, yeah, and they're and they're. I can't say good good enough things about them. I was actually hanging out with them today. They're based here in Nottingham. They're a legendary label. They started off. They they, they signed Napalm Death. They were the first band to sign Napalm Death, a legendary Napalm Death. And they obviously diversified over the years. They were kind of 
very heavy metal grindcore label and now they've, they've diversified into more more of the hard rock and stuff and they've been brilliant and Nuclear Blast who were with I've got to say for, for nine years and did four records with were wonderful and in this day and age to be at the label that long Mm. Uh, as a testimony in itself but we just felt um, and, and you know they were they were prepared to make another record with us but we we both sort of felt no maybe it's ran its course it's time for a change with everything that went on and um sometimes that's a good thing so we we went we went with the eric records and they've been phenomenal they just got us a top 10 record here in the uk we went in at number six in the national charts and number one in the rock chart and you know we've charted in germany and sweden and in in, in the top 20s over there uh, They've done a fantastic job. They've really been great. Yeah, it's got to be a little bit scary, maybe a little bit of trepidation, but it seems like it's turned out for the best, huh? I think so. You know, sometimes it's just good to make a change. You know, I think we obviously with the lineup changes and we just thought, well, we'll, we'll have a bit of a label change and, and, and bring in some, you know, some freshness, just shake the thing up a little bit. Uh, and it's, it's just worked really, really well. And everything we've asked for, they've given us. And they've been so supportive. And they get it because they're fans. You know, I was there today and it was, we were just hanging out, talking about music all day. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was a great vibe. Um, you know, you said you start your, your UK tour. Is, are things going to be, I'm, I'm not a musician, I've never been in a band. When you walk up on stage, there's only four guys up there. Is that going to feel weird to you or no? Or, or maybe um, you can have the Scott, Scott next Well, week? we've already done it. We've already played. Uh, we did a show. Uh, we headlined a festival here in, in December. Okay. Um, with the new lineup, so that was great. And you know, I, I come from my old band, The Almighty, it was a four piece. I played a bunch of guitar in that. And then my solo band, Fighting Hearts, I turned my solos to one. That's a four piece as well. I play guitar in that. So it's not alien to me. So what we're actually doing with this tour, we're celebrating it. We're promoting a new album. We're celebrating 10 years of Black Star Riders as well. So we've brought Scott Gorham back. And we, we've brought Jimmy DeGrasso back uh, for this tour only on drums. So what we do is we, we, will go, we go on. We start off as a four piece. We play a few songs, a few tracks from the new album, a couple of oldies. And then Scott comes up and joins us for the remainder of the set. So we do about 13 songs with Scott. We go through the back catalog. We play a couple of Lizzie songs. Of course we do with Scott Gorons there. You have to, which is great. And, and that's, so that's how it works. And uh, the first time we tried it was back in December at that festival and everybody seemed to really dig it and it went really, really well. And uh, yeah, but only for this tour, you know, after this tour, we're, 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 we'll be full on a four piece going forwards. Yeah. Jimmy, I haven't seen Jimmy near since his days in Megadeth and uh, what a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's an amazing drummer and uh, you know it's it's fun having him back and it's great uh, but you know Zach who played on the album as well as a is a, an amazing drummer and he was very gracious in stepping aside to let Jimmy come in and do this 10th anniversary tour but we're looking forward to very much to welcoming Zach back you know once we once we get done with this this run all right Ricky uh, final thing here for you um some guy named Jay Rustin wanted me to ask you about too many, <laughs> too many what does that guy know that guy knows nothing <laughs> he doesn't know anything about play, about making no. rock music he wanted me to ask you about too many wires. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a it's it's a it's a story from a gig in Ireland many many years ago, um, and I think the guy that booked the gig in 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 rural Ireland, rural Ireland, that's not easy to say, um, didn't know what he was booking, and you know we turn up, the fans turn up, his venue stroke bar gets wrecked. And the locals don't know what's hit him, <laughs> and we were sort of packing up to leave the leave the leave the venue. And a very disgruntled uh, owner came up to us and sort of looked me straight in the in the in the in the eye and said, "You're too loud. You have too many wires, and you won't be back." <laughs> I remember you have too many. You have, you have too many wires. I just thought that was brilliant. I just thought, <laughs> wow, we have too many wires. You know, you know what's funny about yeah, that? I, I've been on stage. I've seen hundreds of concerts, maybe a thousand. I don't know, but you know, stages typically when you see them, they are spotless. I've seen guys roadies stuff vacuum oh, man. carpets. Yeah, I, know, yeah. right? I watched Bob Dylan one time, and there was wires all over the goddamn stage. And I'm like, old school. What is this well, mess? Here? Yeah. Well, this was a three piece uh, sort of hardcore band I was playing in after the Almighty split up. I was in for a brief time called Sick S I C. Uh, we're all Irish boys, and. uh you know, so we were playing pretty small venues, but it was very hardcore punk rock. So the people that came, it was a lot of moshing and everything. You can imagine going on. I think this guy just didn't know what was going on. I think I think somebody said to him, "Look, you, the pub will be busy and you'll make a lot of money on on the booze." But I didn't think he, he expected what had happened. But you know, we 
we were old school. We were all plugged in. There was no radio mics or anything like that, you know. So it was by the time we jumped about, it was like spaghetti junction on stage with the wires <laughs> crossed and everything. And he just he just didn't seem to dig it, you know. And it was just like, all right, you know, okay, we we'll, we won't be coming back. So there you go. <laughs> you, pr- you probably haven't heard that critique since. But Jay Jay, lo- Jay loves that story, and I, ha- I have to tell that story every time I see Jay Rustin. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is uh, Jay uh, grew up across the the river here and just over in Canada. sure and he actually did, yeah. he uh he went to school with one of my friends darren mccarty who was an nhl hockey player oh and, right on if you've heard of him yeah 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 and of course a legend here in detroit and uh, i've never yep. met jay so i just text him every once in a while when i need a question for a for an artist he's worked with and that's what he sent me so right not too many ones he's great i can't say en- enough good things about jay jay's just just a great guy to work with a great temperament phenomenal engineer um phenomenal um knowledge of music and and he pushes you man you know there's no auto tuning there's no cutting corners you he pushes you till you get it right and i love that about him uh you know maybe I'd, i'm not sure i do it at the time <laughs> but the end result is always really really great and he's a great great guy to work with and i love working with him he seems to really have his finger on the pulse of uh of a lot of rock bands right now last last five or eight years yeah yeah, I mean, he, well, he deservedly so gets a lot of work because he's he's one of the best in the business. But he's got a great ear, and I think he never loses sight of the fact that when Jay makes a record, he's not making a Jay Rustin record. Mm-hmm. He's making the record of the band he's working with. And that's the sign of a great producer. Like, he will morph into it. Whichever band he's working with, he will understand that he's making a record for that band, you know, and uh, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, Ricky, good luck with everything. Hopefully, I'll be able to see you over here. I think the last time I saw you live was uh, uh, on that Judas Priest tour in 2015. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're definitely hoping to rectify that. We're you know we're working on them um, on, on looking at some North American dates for this year for sure. You know, with the you know with with three of us obviously being based in the U S. US now, that's going to make things a lot easier. So uh, we we will we will get out there for sure at some point. Yeah, I think I might see uh, my old friend and, of course, uh, yours as well, Damon Johnson, this weekend. So, Or next weekend. Oh, man. Well, give him a big hug from me. I'm so happy for Damon. Damon, Damon, I was like, bro, I was like, not only do you get to play in Finn Lizzie, but you're in Leonard Skinner now. I mean, <laughs> come on. You know? That's and he's true. like, yeah. And I was like, yeah. But, he, you know, he he deserves it because he's one of the good guys. He's a phenomenal guitar player. And if there was anybody that was going to be able to – carry on Gary Rossington's legacy and play the parts with the passion and, and, and style that Gary plays them. Yeah. It's Damon Johnson. Yeah. So he, he's, uh, yeah. He, put, he puts that band obviously up on a pedestal and uh, just yeah. a fast fact about uh, Damon Johnson. He was introduced to his wife by Darren McCarty right here. In Detroit. That's right. That's, that's where I know the whole thing. That's what I'm trying to think. That's, that's right. Cause he, he told me that story. Yeah, there you go. But I miss Damon. Uh, we talk a lot. Obviously, I don't get to see him as much, but we're still, you know, we're still bros. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm just so happy for him. I'm happy he's doing so well. He deserves it. Well, good luck to you. Uh, the, the record on the wrong side of paradise is out right Thank now. Thank you. I have fun on those European tour days, man. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's going to be great. You know, we've got Michael Monroe out with us. Um, oh, okay. Wow. Um, which is great. And we've got Phil Campbell from Motorhead. We've got his band, Phil Campbell and the Bastard Sons are out with yeah. us. So what a lineup, you know, it's yeah, just no incredible. Doubt. So uh, it's going to be fun. You know, I'm, I, n- no pressure following those two acts, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ricky, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you.